Hey everyone, it's Jacob. In 2014, I wrote a book called The Future of Work. And in that book, I created a concept and an image called the evolution of the employee, which looks at how employees are evolving and changing and what organizations need to do to adapt. I actually shared that image on LinkedIn fairly recently and it went completely viral. It got over 1 million views on LinkedIn and thousands of interactions and engagements and comments around the world. In fact, it became so popular that I decided to expand on that concept a little bit and I put together a brand new PDF which goes into more detail looking at what that evolution of the employee looks like and also provides action items for what you and your organization can do to evolve and adapt as a result. So if you wanna get access to that PDF, go to thefutureemployee.com. Again, that is thefutureemployee.com. As 2021 comes to a close and we get ready to start 2022, I wanted to take a look back at the top 10 episodes of the year. Uh, 2021 has brought with it a lot of change and disruption, not just in our organizations, but in our personal lives as well, and I'm not immune to that. My wife, two kids, and two dogs recently moved from the Bay Area to Southern California to be closer to family, and although my wife and I are from Southern California, we never in a million years thought we would end up back here. But then COVID happened, and now here we are. Uh, we have all gone through personal and professional change, and it's not going to stop. If anything, it's going to accelerate. For years, I've been interviewing leaders and experts on this show, The Future of Work with Jacob Morgan, but for some reason, everything felt a little bit different in 2021. The advice from these experts and from these leaders became more real and critical to success as organizations and leaders faced unprecedented challenges and change every single day. The future of work is indeed here, and we have to do everything we can to adapt and prepare, and perhaps most importantly, we need to do everything we can to shape what the future of work is going to look like. Clearly, you have that same belief, uh, you have that same mindset and that same desire, otherwise you wouldn't be listening to this show. So I really do hope that you enjoy these top 10 episodes, and the way that this is going to work is I'm going to introduce each clip before it'll play, then you will hear a soundbite uh, around five to 10 minutes from a particular guest. I'll also give you the title of the full episode in case you want to go back and hear that entire conversation. The world is changing quickly. What do you need to know and do in order to be successful now and in the future? From leadership to the future of work to employee experience, this show will give you the insights and the tools you need to succeed and thrive professionally and personally. Make sure to follow me on Spotify or subscribe to the show on your favorite platform. You can do so easily by going to futureofworkpodcast.com. Also, please rate the podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever your preferred platform is. It really helps spread the word about the show and I personally appreciate it. The first clip you will hear is from my conversation with Sebastian Bazin, CEO of Accor. Leading more than 280,000 global employees can be intimidating for some, but Sebastian says it doesn't matter how big your team is or how big your company is, because at the end of the day, it's all about the individuals. The most important part of leading any group of people, Sebastian says, is to remember that everything you do is critical your words, your face, your presence, your body language, everything about you as a leader is important. Being honest and transparent is crucial for leadership success. In this interview clip that you're about to hear, Sebastian shared how he actually wrote his own job description and how he handles the intense pressure that modern leaders face. When something happens to him, Sebastian asks himself a series of questions to put things into perspective. If you want to go back and listen to the full conversation, the title of this episode was Crucial Life and Leadership Lessons from Sebastian Bazin, CEO of Accor. You can either Google that or the title of any of the episodes that I'll share with you, or you can find them on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, or whatever your preferred platform is. You mentioned earlier that it was a, a bad financial choice for you, but it was a good personal one and that it kind of transformed who you are as, as a leader and as a person. Can you talk a little bit about um, 
what you meant there? Well, when you work in private equity uh, and you manage other people's money, you have true incentive. If you happen to be mostly right, uh, you do share part of the part of the uh, value add capital gain, and you, whether it's ten percent, five percent, twenty percent. If you manage billions, five percent of billions, when you actually have a gain, it's a lot of money, uh, and it's being shared by a few individuals and. Uh, and I accepted that were the rules at the time. If you happen to be a chairman and CEO of a French little company, you have a lot of scrutiny on how much money you make. You have to compare it to other CEOs in France. And it is uh, a fraction of what I was making when I was in college. Uh, but of course, I knew it. I didn't go blind. Uh, but I, I, never, I, I, I never did, never will put money at the forefront of anything I do. So I, I'm... I'm fortunate enough to have had some money aside. But, uh, no, it was just time. It's, uh, forget what I said about the world's financial decision. That, that was not even part of the equation when my decision was made. How do you set personal goals or expectations for yourself uh, as far as learning, growth, development? I, I don't. I, I'm only passing here, Jacob, in my role as CEO. Somebody's going to be succeeding me. It will be a different person. Uh, thinking and acting differently. I just want, uh, yeah, I do have a, little, a bit of ego, which means I just leave, want to leave behind a footprint. I mean, my print of what I've done, which is hopefully transforming this company to a much different company, which it is today, from the one I inherited in terms of segment geographies uh, and not of things. I, I think I'm good. But I, I'll go back to the question before, if you, if you accept. Yes. It's very critical for me and, and probably uh, okay for the viewers. In terms of leader for me, I'll tell you the process on all my decision making always, always being the same in my past years and at the, and the process is the following. Any decision I make, 100%, they start with my stomach. Hmm. my instinct, my belly. Number two, they go through my heart, whether that decision which is instinctive, how generous, non-generous, impactful it is on humans and the community. And only third comes the brain and the head to give you the tempo in which that decision should be implemented. Hmm. Anybody starting reversely, I believe will fail which is also my critiques on a lot of government, they are so intelligent that they start with their brain and they forget their stomach. So again, it works for me. I think it's gonna work for many other people. The next clip is from How to Create Executive Presence and Why It's So Important with Tom Henschel. He's the host of The Look and Sound of Leadership. Leaders need more than just business skills to succeed. They also must have executive presence that motivates and inspires their teams. Executive presence can set confident leaders apart and open doors for themselves and their companies. Tom actually studied drama at the Juilliard School and was a professional actor for 20 years before becoming a communication and leadership coach. He shared why executive presence matters so much and how all leaders can develop and strengthen their executive presence. I hope you enjoyed this clip from Tom Henschel. Uh, and so how did you get from the acting into leadership stuff? Because I see some similarities, but they're also pretty different. They are. Um, the connection for me, really, Jacob, was always around teaching that I, when I was in high school, I taught others when, I mean, in high school, I even taught junior high school, believe it or not. That was so weird. I taught through Juilliard. I, I've always taught. When I came to Hollywood, I taught at a conservatory. So when I saw my career ending, because I could kind of see that my career was not going to, my television career was not going to sustain me until I was like 60. It just mm -hmm. wasn't. I thought I would be a teacher. And I, um, I taught for a couple semesters at a college out here and just was so unhappy, Jacob. Oh my God, it was not a good fit for me. And then I found this thing called corporate training and literally in the first, I don't know, couple of years, somebody said to me, would you work one-on-one -on -one with our division presidents? And, you know, actors never say no, whether they know what they're doing or not, actors never say no. And so I said, sure, I'll work with your 
presidents, not knowing what I was doing, and I was doing coaching. I hmm. mean, that's it. I was suddenly coaching. So I've been coaching a long time. Well, I know we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, so maybe before we wrap up, uh, for people who are watching or listening who are thinking, I want to immediately start improving or working on my executive presence. Do you have some action items that people can start right after they're done listening or watching to this, uh, watching this? Yes, I do. So one of the things that we all have in our pockets is a filmmaking machine, right? Yep. You can, so f first of all, we're all seeing ourselves on video. You could actually watch, but you're not, that's usually not why you're there. But you could make a video of yourself explaining something, whatever. And then don't only watch it alone, because I don't think most of us know how to really be constructive watching ourselves in playback. I think that's a hard skill. But ask three, four, five people, and here's the question I would ask them. Would you watch this, I don't know, 45-second clip? Would you watch this 90-second clip? And would you send me back three words that it evokes? And just that's all you're asking for is three words. And see what the consensus is. See where it goes. Because it's kind of like you, Jacob, asking for all those feedback forms. Ask for some feedback from others and just watch and see what how it goes. And see if you want to adopt those words or change those words over time. If you did one of those a week, I'll bet you would get really good at it. This next clip is from an episode called The Top 15 Leadership Lessons from 2020. I know it sounds a bit funny to do a top 10 episode where one of those top episodes is a mashup of other episodes, but it is what it is, even though it feels a bit, dare I say, meta. 2020 was a tough year, and that continues to extend into 2021 and 2022. This episode specifically featured the best leadership advice from 15 past podcast guests, including Arthur Blank, the co-founder of The Home Depot, Netflix co-founder and first CEO Mark Randolph, the CEO of Honeywell, Microsoft U.S. President Kate Johnson, and others. Their lessons ranged from creating your own luck to leading by example, and even what to do if you feel stuck at work. I chose one particular clip from that episode to share with you, and it's from Mark Randolph, the first CEO and co-founder of Netflix, as he talks about what culture is and what it isn't. Culture is not what you say. Uh, culture is not what you put in a culture deck. Culture is not what you carve in your headstone. Culture is not something you sit around a table and brainstorm things like, what should our culture be? Culture is how you act. It's how you are. It's the things you do. And even more importantly, culture springs from how the founders and the early employees act with each other, with their employees, with their customers. Mm -hmm. And so huge amounts of the Netflix cultures arise organically from the way that Reed and I behave, the way that I treat people, the way I worked with people before. Uh, when, when we did Netflix and I, I glossed over, I said, you know, we raised the money, we got an office, we hired a dozen people. I didn't put ads for hiring people. This was more like uh, that scene from the Blues Brothers movie where I'm driving around getting the band back together. So I'm going to these people who I've worked with before, or who I know well enough to know how they work. And you're finding these people who I know can work autonomously, who I know enjoy that, who I, who I know enjoy the fact that they come to work not knowing what they're going to face, but will rise to the challenge of whatever happens. So I'm laying that out because mm -hmm. you have to understand that what was there was there. That culture yeah. was just organically part of who we were. Um, but you make a really good point, is that those attributes I was just describing about people having tremendous amounts of responsibility for their things, but wanting the autonomy to work by themselves, to really love having their job be different, um, that's an easy culture to maintain when you have a dozen people. But what happens is as companies get larger, it's very easy to lose that. Um, at the beginning, and pardon me if I digress a little bit, but this is all about um, how you work with people. At the beginning, it's really easy to tell one of these chosen few and go, uh, Christina, you see that mountain two miles away? I'll meet you there, and you know that here's the things you need to get accomplished. And she goes, got it. 
and then I don't even think about it again because I know that two weeks from now I will find Christina on top of the mountain, maybe bruised and bloodied, but she'll be there on time with everything she's responsible for, that she'll have solved every problem that came her way on her own without input from me. That's a great way of working. But what happens is when you get bigger, something happens where someone shows up late or they show up, you know, don't have everything done. And a lot of managers would say, oh, this isn't good. Okay, we can't have that happen again. Everybody, I want status reports. I need to know if there's gonna be a problem in advance. So everyone status reports. And everyone goes, oh, status reports. <laughs> and then someone else shows up and they're there on time with it all done, but they spent too much. And it's many managers will go like, oh, that's can't let that happen. Okay, I need everyone who spends more. I need to pre, I want to pre-approve anything over hundred dollars to make sure you don't make a spending mistake. And then everyone goes, oh God, expense reports. And little by little, what you're doing is you're building a company to protect yourself from people with bad judgment. But what you're also doing is driving the people who have good judgment crazy. And so we kind of decided what would happen if we built a company that was for people with good judgment, people hmm. who loved having that freedom to make their own decisions, to be close to the action, to decide for themselves what the appropriate thing to do was, but had the responsibility of knowing that we counted on them to get those things done. And I will confess, we almost lost it because as we got bigger, as hiring became, got to a point where I didn't know everybody anymore. Um, they didn't all have contact with myself or with Reed. Yeah. Um, you began to lose some of that inadvertently. Uh, and then we kind of had some problems, which I'm sure we can talk about a little bit, that required us to have a layoff. And we needed to lay off nearly 40% of our company. And there was that classic managerial problem of saying, we're going to have to do everything we did before, but with 40% less people, this is going to be really hard. But instead, yeah. as we moved into that period, it was the opposite. It was fun. It was exciting. It felt like we were a startup again because yeah. there was no time for the command and control. We were back to uh, see you on the mountain in two weeks. Uh, and we had gotten the staff back down to the place where the only people there were the people with good judgment that we could trust that wanted to work that way. And that I think is the point where we said, we have to be actively trying to maintain this culture. We have yeah. to call each other on it when we're not doing this. And then began that longer um, process led by Patty McCord, who was our head of human resources at the time to say, how do you scale this beyond 200? How do you scale it to 2000? How do you scale it to 7,000 where they are now? And that I think is part of the ongoing Netflix culture experiment, which is how do you create this freedom, this culture of freedom and responsibility, this culture of radical honesty, but not just in a small company, but in fact, in a very, very large one. Next up on our list, we have an episode called How to Go from Top Performer to Excellent Leader, which was done with Ryan Hawk, who's the host of The Learning Leader Show. Being a top performer doesn't mean you are a great leader, but so many companies still rely on this benchmark alone when promoting people to leadership roles. Ryan learned this as he excelled in his career and then was put in management positions with absolutely no training or guidance where he had to learn on the fly. Organizations need to look for other characteristics in their leaders other than just being a great worker, and they need to invest more in training future leaders. In this interview that you're about to hear, Ryan shared what he looks for in a good leader and how companies can solve the leadership problem. Ryan says the best leaders start by leading themselves. So I'm curious, from all the leaders that you interviewed, are there any that pop to mind as far as being the most memorable discussions you've had? Um, and can you share anything about, about what you've learned from some of these memorable interviews? <laughs> as you know, there, um, this is a question that's similar to asking who is my favorite child. Um, <laughs> and, uh, that, that changes by the day. <laughs> no, um, 
I, if I had to name a few, um, I would say it's 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 more along the lines of the relationships that have been built since we've recorded. So yeah. the first one that comes to mind would be four star general Stanley McChrystal, uh, primarily because we had a great talk. Um, and I looked up to General McChrystal in his book Team of Teams yeah. for a long time and was fortunate that he came on the show. But but and, and it was a great episode. But the, the coolest part was at the end of it, he invited me to come to Gettysburg and tour the battlefield along with him and the class that he teaches wow. at Yale. And uh, I canceled everything and, and and jumped on a flight and I did it and you know did a did a, a morning run before the same sun came up to the battlefield from the hotel with general mccrystal and his wife and some other Jeez. friends and students and then we toured the thing the whole day i had a big dinner and it it, it was a life-changing event and it went it went well and i i ended up um uh asking him afterwards if he would write the forward to my book um i just thought well i might as well swing for the fences What's the worst that could happen? And uh, he said yes, and he did. And now he, you know, he 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 wrote the forward to my book. So it's it, it a, a lot of lessons learned. If you approach people with genuine curiosity and you're trying to learn, you you're interested in their story and them. You never really know what could happen. You could become friends with one of your heroes, and and in that case, um, it's a relationship that I'm, I I really value, and I I have a a, a number of those, but. This is one that, that's really important to me. So I would say he has come on the podcast again. So he's been on more than once, but also has written that forward and, and did it as like he didn't act like he was doing me a favor or anything. He was just said, sure, and and then and, and really pieced together some some really great work that I'm yeah. proud is is in my book and it, in fact leads off the book. Um, so I would say General Crystal's is probably uh, at or near the top of the list. So your your book has an interesting title, uh, how to go from top performer to excellent leader. So first, what is the difference between being a top performer and an excellent leader? Because oftentimes people mix up the two and they think that if you are a great performer, you're a great individual contributor, inherently you're a leader or inherently you're going to be a good leader because you're, you're driving results. Um, mm -hmm. but as we now know, those are not the same thing. So what's the difference? Well, I mean, it's it's funny. I mean, the 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 way to get the opportunity to interview for a management job at most places and and the place where I worked was they they look at the top of the stack rankings and the handful of people at the top of the the stack the sales stack rankings get a chance to interview and they have the best chance to to get the job. And and the 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 funny part about it is there's there's very little of what you did as an individual contributor that actually translates to you being a good coach or manager of a team of others doing that. Yeah. Um, the the skill set's just completely different. And I understand why you look towards the top performer because basically the, the, the thought process is, well, they were really good, so they probably have earned some respect from their peers. Let's elevate them and then tell them, okay, tell everybody else exactly what you did so that you can create a bunch of clones, essentially. Yeah. And and so I, I get that's, that that's, that's why it happens. However, there are some, there are a lot of, superstar performers that are horrible coaches it's just like have you did you ever grow up in a math class with a math teacher who was a genius when it comes to solving math equations and math problems however what they weren't good at was explaining how to do it to others yep. they could get up on the board and pop, 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 pop. I'm, I'm thinking one specific teacher right now he was incredible at actually doing the math problem but when anyone else who wasn't nearly as smart as him had questions, he struggled to explain how oh, we yeah. could do it, right? So the yeah. same thing happens in sports. Like Mag Magic Johnson coached the Lakers at one point. He was terrible at it, right? But he because he's a great player. Michael Jordan, same, not really a great coach. Larry Bird was a coach, but was just okay, a better front office guy of selecting talent than he is actually coaching others. So it's not always the top performer and is going to be – a great coach like look in the nfl a lot of the great coaches were not the starting quarterback they were the backup or the third stringer or even guys who didn't make it to the nfl are doing it sean McVay is one of them he went to miami where i went initially and and was was an average receiver and now he's like the hot coach in the nfl so i think the same happens in this in the sales world the same happens in in in, in all the business world where you're just grabbing the top performer without actually fully checking can they 
can they coach others who aren't as talented as them? Can they help other people who aren't naturally as good as them? Yeah. And that's the problem is, is, is sometimes we elevate and promote people who are just not good teachers, not good coaches. And, and a big element of management of leading a team is, is teaching and coaching other people to levels that they didn't even realize they were capable of reaching. The next episode is a conversation that I had with Aaron Ain. And the title of this episode is Aaron Ain. CEO of 13,000 person Ultimate Kronos Group on building a company where everyone loves to work. Building a company where people want to come to work is all about trust, transparency, and collaboration. Aaron should know because UKG is regularly rated as one of the best places to work globally. He believes employees don't come to work for free food or parties, but because of the organization itself. One of the biggest factors in employee engagement and satisfaction is the leaders employees work with daily, which is why UKG places such high emphasis on leadership, training, and evaluation. In this episode, Aaron offered an inside look at what makes UKG a great place to work and shares the importance of consistency, humility, and gratitude for leaders. Can you share a little bit about what's included in that training program? Uh, you know, what are some of the things that you teach your leaders to be able to do to be great people leaders? Well, we teach them the definition of, of trust and respect, you know, in a, in a way they maybe haven't heard it before. We teach them the meanings of communication and transparency and, and collaboration. Look, we also teach them, you know, other things like how to run an effective, respectful meeting, how to go interview people and, and evaluate things like that, how to go work cross-functionally. So it's not just around all these things that get you great scores on your MEI. It's also about other aspects of what it takes to be a good leader. Hmm. I think what we do a little bit differently than others is I think other training programs for managers do focus on a lot of those things, but I don't think they focus as actively on those components of trust, transparency, communication, collaboration, honesty. I'm also curious, it seems, so we talked a lot about the, um, the leaders inside of, of UKG. But what about people who are not responsible for others? And I'm really curious during the interview process, are there certain questions or things that you look for that you think are unique to UKG that maybe other companies are not asking or thinking about? Well, well look, I don't know if they're unique, but I, I think about how we demand them. Let me answer it a teensy weensy bit differently. Here's how I feel about what we've been talking about the past 15 minutes. I have a certain value system that's really important to me. We just talked about it. I then go hire people who share my value systems and I hold them accountable to my value systems. They then hire people who share their value systems. And yeah. so these things just perpetuate themselves. I tell people companies don't change as they get bigger. The leadership at the company changes. That's when you can expect a possible change. And so I think what we look for, you know, we have a whole set of values at the company that are focused around, you know, core components of things we talked about. And then that translates into expected behaviors. So we look for those values when we interview people and we look for people who have those behaviors um, in those ways. And it doesn't always work out, but um, that's what we look for. And, and it's easier when you create an environment with low turnover like we have, where people who share those values come together. Hmm. And continue to perpetuate them. Next up, we have one of my favorite episodes, which was called The Father of Emotional Intelligence on How to Manage Your Emotions at Work and Why EQ is More Valuable Than IQ. This interview was done with psychologist and best-selling author Daniel Goleman. Emotional intelligence includes empathy, adaptability, staying positive, and focusing on a goal without getting distracted. It's crucial for all leaders and employees, especially as they work with other people and have to control their emotions and spread their emotional state to others. Daniel is the ultimate expert on EQ and shared why it matters, how it can be developed, and even why it can be more important than IQ, which used to be the standard for measuring intelligence. When we think about emotional intelligence, 
how many which which emotions go into that uh, i know you've written about this extensively um so what are the emotions that go into that intelligence uh, grouping uh every emotion you've ever felt anything Anything. So yes. anger, disgust, sadness, all of that yeah. is a part of so, it. However, here's what emotional intelligence tells you. If you're in a negative emotional state, it because of the way the brain is wired, you're narrowing the bandwidth of your other capabilities, your cognitive abilities, whatever mm. talents you may have. Because emotions, the way the brain is designed and wired, take up a huge amount of space. In fact, Emotional distractions, that thing she said to me that got me so upset, are far stronger than external distractions. It's going to cop mm. your, your uh, attention continually. So emotional intelligence helps you manage disturbing emotions. And it also encourages you to have positive emotions, to have an optimistic outlook. So they call it a growth mindset these days, you know. Yeah. I can get better, other people can get better. Uh, you don't feel that way when you're entrapped by a negative emotion. It helps you keep your eye on your goals, no matter what else is going on, because we all need to do that. It helps you adapt, helps you be agile. Uh, we absolutely need to do that. These are all competencies, by the way, of outstanding leaders, and they're based on emotional intelligence abilities because... People, leaders need to first lead themselves, and that means manage yeah. your inner life. Then you can lead others. You can tune into them with empathy. And then, this is really important, it turns out that a leader's emotional state is contagious. It leaks out to the people around them. It's just very natural for people to pay most attention to and put most importance on what the most powerful people, person in the room says and does. So hmm. the leader's emotions affect other people's emotions. And not only that, that in turn drives performance. So if the leader is in a negative state, people catch that negative state, their performance goes down. If, they're in a, if the leader's in a positive state, pretty enthusiastic, energetic, people catch that, their performance goes up. So it, hmm. it's not just a private thing. Leaders should know that they're state, their inner state is going to leak. That's part of their leadership is managing themselves. How do you create emotional intelligence in others? So maybe you're a leader and you want members of your team to be emotionally well, intelligent or your peers. Well, I, I'm just doing an article for the Harvard Business Review on how to create an emotionally intelligent organization. Hmm. And it turns out that the biggest, uh, w uh, biggest improvement in emotional intelligence doesn't come in trying to hire for it, that's very dicey, but rather in helping people develop it. And there's a mm. lot of methodologies uh, for developing emotional intelligence that are used in corporations, in organizations now. So I would say uh, to help people find a program that works for them or a coach, uh, mm. if you're at a certain level in the organization, that may work out too from a payback point of view. But it is, as I said, it's all learned and learnable. There yep. are four or five basic steps. One is you ask yourself or ask the person, do you really care? Because if the answer is no, you can stop right there. Yeah. Because it's going to take a little effort. It's going to take some time. Uh, the next thing is to get a good evaluation, whether it's from uh, you know, talking to people or this emotional social competence inventory, something like that, a 360 where people evaluate you anonymously and you get the information aggregated so you don't know who said what, then people can be much more open with you. Yeah. And then um, uh, have someone you can work with who's going to help you, whether it's a coach or someone leading this development effort. Uh, someone you can talk to when you have a bad day, uh, having, having learning partners, but also someone to support you, and also practicing at every naturally occurring opportunity. That's mm. really going to make a difference. This clip you're about to hear is from an episode called How to Thrive in a Post-COVID-19 World, and it was done with Jeff Schwartz, U.S. Leader for the Future of Work at Deloitte. 
Business leaders are always looking to see what's coming in the future of work, but the pandemic accelerated timetables and now Jeff believes we are at the end of the beginning of the future of work. In the next chapter, we will see the implementation and scaling of the technologies that we have in place. Jeff and his team at Deloitte have released annual trends reports since 2011 that track where the world of work is heading. In this interview, Jeff shared his most recent insights and how the pandemic will forever change how we work. What was it like to, to live in a village in Nepal? Because I think uh, you said there was no electricity, no running water, and you were there for a while. What, did, what was that like? What did that teach you? Um, well, it's interesting. What, what did I learn from the experience? Maybe a, another way of putting it. Um, so I was there in 1981 to 1983. I know you said you were born in 1983, but even when you were born was before the internet. So we were before yes. the internet, before cell phones. It, you know, I, I called my mom once from Kathmandu and, you know, we had operators on the line in Kathmandu and Delhi and, and London and New York and then Long Island where my mom was living. And so this was, you know, early, uh, early days. It, it was phenomenal. Um, you know, um, I think one of the, one of the important disciplines in the future of work that we're exploring, I certainly talk about it in my book, is um, cultural anthropology and the importance mm -hmm. of, of social anthropology, which Jillian Ted, of course, talks about um, quite a bit in her research and the chance to live in another part of the world, but really to live there um, and, and to work and to study and, you know, nobody spoke English in this village. I was the only Peace Corps volunteer in the village. I had to learn Nepali, Nepali, which is how Nepalese is referred to in the local language. Um, so it was a, a very big experience in learning and listening and adapting, which was phenomenal. Would mm. recommend it to anybody who's looking for a good experience, whether they're in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, or 60s. For people who are uh, watching or listening who are thinking, okay, you know, what, what's the big deal? Why is... COVID such a big deal? Why is it changing or altering work so much? Uh, how come after the vaccine gets distributed, you know, by this time next year or by the end of this year, why won't things just go back to normal the way they always used to be? So what what is it that you think is going to be so transformative? Well, I think what is the most transformative thing about the transition we talk about uh, in Deloitte, we talk about the transition from survive to thrive. So the, 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 we went through a re response, a recovery. Now we might describe it as an extended recovery. And then we have a post-COVID period. Um, is that we discovered a whole set of choices in COVID and in 2021 that we, we actually, in a way, didn't have before. Hmm. Right? We discovered that a lot of people can work remotely a lot of the time and be productive. Yeah. We have to now decide how much of that do we want? That's the choice. Now, the question isn't whether we go back to the office or whether we stay at home. The question is what combination of them we will adopt as individuals and companies and communities in order to make it work. This, this is a choice. We saw, the way, one of the ways I, I think it's interesting to look at it, we saw a lot of what I call 10X in 2020. We, we, we often talk about exponential change and, and Moore's law, and that, I'm sure that's very familiar to, to many of the people that have been listening to you and, and, and reading your work for, for many years. Um, but we all saw 10X in yeah. 2020. I'll just give a couple of really quick examples. We saw 5% of the workforce go from working remotely to 50% of the workforce working remotely. We saw the, the average number of telemedicine visits go up tenfold. We, we saw systems that had four or 500 telemedicine visits in a major city go up to 5,000 telemedicine visits wow. in a city, 10X. And, and the most obvious one, which I had to be reminded of, was um, it used to take 10 years to develop a vaccine. Look it up. How long does it take to develop a vaccine? Look at the vaccines yeah. over the last hundred years. By the way, they don't go back much more than a hundred years, although there's some earlier um, efforts in it. We developed vaccines, four or five of them, in 300, 330, 360 days. Right? That's 10x. So the, the one of the questions in front of us now is, what's the version of 10x 
that we are going to choose. How do we live and learn and lead? Those would be the three things that we're talking about a lot in our work in a 10X world. That's a choice, right? How do I use the ability to work with machines, the different employment models, the different workplace options to do things differently and to get different results, which we can obviously go into if you want. Next up, we have an interview with Steve Preston called The Future of Work Post-COVID-19, Insights from Goodwill CEO. With more than 140,000 employees across the U.S. and 650 job centers for training and development and placement, Steve has unique insights into how the world of work is changing, especially amidst the pandemic. Over the past few years, companies have accelerated their digital transformations, making digital skills more crucial than ever. Steve shared his predictions for the future of work and how companies can move to a hybrid model, as well as how employees can increase their skills, add digital capabilities, and build their networks to find and grow their careers. So what's, uh, what's the answer? I mean, do you, do you see in person disappearing completely like some people have said and you know major cities like san francisco near where i live are going to vanish and everyone's going to move away from these places everyone's going to be remote forever or do you still see us returning to some sense of you know going into the office and seeing people face to face i think that i think it's going to be in part based on the nature of the employer yeah in part based on the nature of the job hmm. um we I think certain jobs lend themselves to uh, remote, uh, you know, kind of, you know, remote access better than others. I think if you have a job where you are a programmer yeah. or you are somebody who is, you know, a content designer or a writer or somebody who really has a lot of independence in their job, a need, not a whole lot of need to be in a group physically. Uh, those are the jobs I think that will continue to be uh, very well served through remote remote work. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's number one. But there are other roles where you just, there is just so much value from having convenings and being able to have sort of that natural flow that occurs uh, when you're in the room where you're passing paper back and forth when you're, for me, the big thing, you know, the killer has been a lack of a whiteboard where we're talking back and forth and adding things. And there is sort of this generative activity that takes place when you're yep. creating as a group. So I, I very much agree that we'll see some sort of a hybrid where, you know, maybe you don't need to come into work every day. You know, maybe you don't need to work nine to five, but there will be a balance of seeing people face to face versus being able to do work remotely. Because you also brought up an interesting point of like innovation, you know, coming up with ideas. As much as we love technology, it is not the same thing doing things virtually versus, you know, being face to face with with people on your team. Yeah, I mean, I mean, picture picture a room with a big whiteboard wall where you're drawing diagrams and you're saying, well, let, let me yeah. take a blue marker and what if we did it this way? And then you're back and forth and you're interacting in a way that that's that's hard to manufacture online. I think one yeah. of the other questions it's going to raise uh, though is what does the workspace look like? Because mm -hmm. you know we have some good common areas in our building, but we've we've always had a a relatively large remote workforce. When everybody comes in for an employee week, you know, they're scrambling for space, you know, trying to figure out where to put everybody. If that changes fundamentally, it's going to be very interesting to see um, how faces, space is engineered, how technology in the space is engineered. Because if you've got three people remotely and five in the room, you got to figure out how to engage that way. And, um, but I think those are the types of things where we've learned how to do things differently and we'll, we'll, we'll bust through those questions. Next up, we have an episode done with Mark Lashier, and it's called How the CEO of CPCAM Leads with Trust, Transparency, and Simplicity. This was an organization that I actually presented to earlier this year, and then their CEO, Mark, agreed to be a guest on the show. Mark has made trust, transparency, and simplicity hallmarks of his leadership style since becoming CEO in 2017, but they became even more critical in the uncertainty of 2020. Mark knew that his employees and his customers had to trust him and each other, and that he had to be open and transparent and remove red tape so that people could actually do their jobs. He believes the best leaders bring these values to life and leverage technology to be open, 
and honest with their employees and customers. In this interview, Mark shares his advice for being honest and leading by example, no matter the circumstances. Do uh, any of your team members or any employees ever uh, call you out on something? Uh, are they comfortable disagreeing with you or, or challenging something that you say? Sure. No, no, absolutely. It's uh, and, and I encourage it. I uh, we we uh, I sent a letter out uh, just this past week addressing the, the, the things that were happening in, in Washington, D.C. recently. And uh, and some some challenged me for the vast majority applauded what we said. Some challenged me for not being uh, aggressive enough in what we were saying about about that event. And some said, you know, I was I was afraid to respond to other other things that you've put out because I, I was just afraid to respond to the CEO. But I've gotten comfortable, and now here here's here's what I want to say. And really, all they wanted to say was thank you, uh, thank you for acknowledging these things, thank you for giving me the the courage to talk to my family and my kids about this. And it really is about making the world a better place for our kids. And so, if you had employees that at one point in time were were concerned or afraid to speak up to the CEO about making the world a better place for their kids. I think that's a huge win that now they're comfortable acknowledging that, hey, it's okay to speak up and talk about these things at work. Oh, I have a, I have a four-year-old daughter and she she very much uh, knows about Alexa and asks yeah. to play music and yep. questions. So yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. right there with you. Yeah. You mentioned something interesting, which was around downtime. Uh, so it kind of feels like nowadays nobody gets downtime because you're always connected. Yeah. But, you know, decades ago, if you were on a plane, I mean, you had downtime. You, you were literally forced to do nothing. Right. Uh, if you got to the hotel, you were forced to do nothing. Right. So it's really interesting. I mean, what was that like? And do you think that our constant reliance on technology now is... Um, I mean, is it a bit of a problem, or what do you do for downtime these days? I think I think every every technology that that, that man develops has a has a downside, a dark side, and I, and I think that uh, we we get all these all these technologies that make us so much more efficient, uh, but actually can steal a lot of our time away if we don't manage them uh, carefully. It puts a great burden on us to to manage it, to to train ourselves to. To manage that more effectively, and you know, I, I used to carry large books with me to read on airplanes, uh, and uh, and occasionally still do. But it's it's so it's so tempting because you know you're going to have all these emails waiting for you after this long flight. You you need to uh, you know you need to get through them. But but really, it's something you have to manage and be intentional, and be disciplined about. I you know I said I, I have to start every day with some kind of exercise because I feel better. <laughs> okay. It's, it's there's, there's a reward there, but, but it's, it's really about being intentional and making that commitment to yourself to be, be more balanced. Cause I think, I think we're better, better human beings, better employees, better spouses, better friends. If we, if we can create a little space to have a little balance in our lives. In rounding out our top 10 episodes for 2021, is one called Creating a Culture of Reinvention by Removing Rules, Giving Freedom, and Hiring and Paying the Best People Well. And it was done with professor and author Aaron Meyer. Netflix is known around the world for its unique culture that can be off-putting for some people. When Aaron first started researching the company, she was taken aback by a culture slide that said adequate performance gets a generous severance. But Netflix's culture has led to incredible growth and turned the company into an innovative leader in technology, entertainment, and customer experience. In this clip, Erin shares insights from her new book, which she co-authored with Netflix founder and CEO Reed Hastings, about what makes the culture of Netflix stand out and how the company's blunt and unconventional ways have inspired its success. Oh man, so many questions I could keep asking you on this. Um, but I guess people are just going to have to grab the book to learn more. I mean, I took tons of notes. I'm looking, I have like an entire word doc filled with questions just so people can get a sense of like how much really interesting stuff there is in this book. Uh, but maybe we can wrap up on one and that is for people who are watching and listening to this, if they want to start to create, I don't even want to say a, a similar culture because I honestly don't think 
that a lot of companies would be able to create a Netflix culture, nor should they necessarily. I don't know. I feel like it's so unique to Netflix um, that it would be hard for another company like a GM or a Pepsi to say, oh, we, we want the Netflix culture and let's embrace it. I mean, do you, is that the case? Like, do you get people coming to you saying, we want to be like Netflix, help us? Yeah, so I want to make two statements. The first, but I'll start by saying, oh my gosh, yes, Jacob. I mean, this is like taking over the world. And I don't mean people are trying to be like Netflix, but what I mean is that people are recognizing, oh, you know, we're still stuck. And before yeah. I, I move on to answer the question, I want to kind of wrap up with that, which is that, um, okay, I said earlier, most organizations today are operating with this industrial era hangover, right? <laughs> and what I mean by that is that during the industrial era, we were all obsessed with error prevention and replicability. And of course, if you are leading a manufacturing plant today, those are still your primary goals. And if those are your primary goals, please do not do anything we talked about today. <laughs> but in a growing number of teams and organizations, the primary goal, the primary risk is no longer making a mistake. The primary mm -hmm. risk is not innovating fast enough or not having a flexible enough environment to react when something like COVID hits us out of the blue, right? And yeah. if you are on a team or organization where your primary goal is innovation and creativity and flexibility, then these principles are very relevant, not just to Netflix, but to you. Okay. And so I will get to the actual answer to the question in a moment. But I'll also say that I think a lot of companies may find that they have some pockets that have each uh, that have both of those in the organization. So, for example, Johnson and Johnson with the the Janssen vaccine, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine that came out of Janssen Pharmaceutical. They have parts of that company where they really needed fast innovation when COVID hit, right? And if you need fast innovation, no rules, rules. Right? Yeah. Sure. Um, but they have other parts of that company that are doing the production of that vaccine. And you better well hope they've got a lot of control mechanisms and processes in place in those parts of the organization, right? Mm. So we can actually think about our, our culture in, in different ways like that. Um, okay. now, I'll come to, now I'll come to your question, okay? Yes. <laughs> um, all right, so your question was, you know, does this apply to our listeners? And what I can tell you is that um, I don't think that anyone needs to try to do to be Netflix. And of course, every company will be their own company. But I think that any team leader or department manager or entrepreneur who's interested in really creating a, an innovative and creative and flexible work environment can just follow these three principles, right? Okay. Number one, what's one thing that I could do in order to increase talent density? in the company. Maybe I'm not ready to implement the keeper test. Maybe I don't want to do that, but I do think that I could hire one new person instead of three and pay them a lot more and get somebody better. And then what's one thing I could do to get a little bit more candor on my team, to get to get that that benefit that comes from our us telling one another what we really think, right? And maybe I'm not ready for the live 360 feedback dinners. <laughs> Um, but maybe I am ready to start putting feedback on the agenda. Okay, now I've got those two things. And now what's one thing I can do in order to give my employees a little bit more freedom? Maybe I can't get rid of the vacation policy because the whole company is using that. But maybe in my department, I can start giving my employees a little bit more responsibility and saying, you know what? You don't have to come to me to get my sign off on these things, right? You decide, yep. right? And in doing so little by little, we can all start having more creative and agile organizations, which we need in the future. Those were the top 10 episodes from 2021. I hope you enjoyed those clips. And again, I encourage you to go back and listen to those full conversations. Thank you to all of the guests and to everyone who listened to and shared the podcast this year and all the previous years. You can find all the episodes of this show, The Future of Work with Jacob Morgan, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Amazon Music, or whatever your preferred platform is. And you can always go to The Future Organization and click on the podcast tab 
to get access to all of these episodes, including transcripts from the shows. Of course, a big thank you to everybody who listens to the show and shares it and sends me comments and messages. Uh, I really appreciate all of your feedback, your insights, your generosity. This show has consistently been ranked as one of the top 30 podcasts in the management category on Apple Podcasts. And I hope that in 2022 and the coming years, we will even be able to make it into the top 10, but that does not happen without your support. So if you enjoy this show, please do me a favor, take a couple seconds, go onto Apple Podcasts, leave a quick review or a rating. You can do this on whatever your preferred channel is, but Apple Podcasts has the greatest impact. Doing these reviews is really what allows me to bring in these amazing guests, these CEOs, these authors, these leaders from around the world. And again, it does not happen without your support. So thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who continues to tune into this show and provide feedback and email me and share this with your friends. I'm looking forward to an amazing year of great content in 2022 and building out this show and strengthening the community that we have all been able to build together. I'll see you in the new year. Thanks again for tuning into today's episode. Please remember to rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever your preferred channel is. I cannot express how important those reviews and ratings are to the success of this show, and they keep allowing me to bring back amazing guests. Lastly, don't forget to check out the brand new PDF that I just put out, which looks at the evolution of the employee. In other words, how employees are evolving and changing and what you as an organization should do to adapt. You'll get a complete breakdown of what that evolution looks like, as well as action items that you can and should be taking. That PDF is available at thefutureemployee.com. And if you want to reach out to me for whatever reason, whether it's inviting me to speak, sponsoring the show, or just giving me some feedback, you can always do so. My email is jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Again, that's jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and I will see you next time.